All right. If you guys have your Bibles, we are back in the book of Romans, chapter 2. And as I was uh, starting to study for this, tonight we're talking about circumcision, so that's fun. Um, if you don't know what that is, go ahead and chat GPT that one later. With images turned off, would probably be for the best. Um, so, uh, anyone, when I say the word circumcision, you have no clue what I'm talking about? Okay, good. I was finna explain it right now. I was gonna... Okay, good. All right. So circumcision, for, to the uninitiated, without going into too much detail... Uh, there was a, a process that was given to um, Jewish people back in the time of the Israelites from God himself that said that he wants his people to be set apart. But that set apartness, that word that we understand God in comparison to us is the word holy. Okay, that word holy means to be set apart. And we understand God's holiness like Josh was just talking about in the context of um, God is wholly different than us. Now that is the, the letter W, holy as in completely but well, how we understand God is he's also holy, H-O-L-Y. And that word means that every aspect of who I am, there's a massive chasm between me and who God is. Okay, so um, Romans chapter 1 begins with this idea of the godlessness and wickedness of people. They either, in mankind, is either worshiping the creator or something creaturely over here. Okay, so this is like creaturely brokenness, depravity, messed up, uh, screwed up, uh, insufficient. Um, uh, every carnal desire and those things over here that are opposed to God is like on this side of the universe, right? So think like, um, think about if this stage expanded 13 and a half billion light years, which is, right, that's the extent of the universe's width. On one end of that universe is us in our imperfection and our brokenness and our, um, our proclivity to evil and bigotry and hatred. Here's us. And then you walk the vast expanse of the universe, which at the speed of light would take you 13.5 billion years to get to the other side of, and then you would find God. And the, the gap between the two parties is known as his holiness, so when we call God holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, it's us on this side of the universe looking at all the divine aspects of God and his character and going, whoa, that's a lot. Whoa, you're so different than I am. My, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to death. Without you, I would cease to exist. In you, I live and move and have my being. Here I am, creature, way over here, deserving of nothing. And there you are, worthy of worship and honor and glory forever. You are the one who is to be praised. Amen. And look how different I am from you. You, couldn't, you would have to like call 58 billion cell phones to get across the gap, to even call him and go, yo, you're different than I am except that he can hear everything, so the analogy falls apart. But, right, that this expanse of just the recognition of how different it is, he is, he is set apart. And so, God calls his people to be holy. He says, I want you to be holy like I am holy. Now, granted, you'll never, we'll never be able to experience that kind of godly holiness, but inside of the realm of the creature, here we are on planet Earth, all of mankind, when God is so much greater and more spectacular, and on our little sphere, God says, as my people, I want you to be set apart from those around you. As I am set apart from you, I want you to be set apart from those around you. So he gave them a series of laws in the Old Testament. One part of that law is what we call ceremonial law. We have another part of the law called civil or moral law. And then we have what we call separation law. Okay, so uh, think about separation law in terms of God looking at um, the other pagan nations around them. And the things that the pagan nations around them worshipped and loved and idolized, God gave specific commands to the Israelites to avoid looking like those people who intentionally used certain things to worship their foreign gods, like tattoos. Okay? In the Old Testament, tattoos were forbidden. Why? They were forbidden because the pagan nations around them, like the Canaanites, would get tattoos to worship foreign deities. Okay? Is it now wrong to have a tattoo? No. Homie is tatted up. Okay? I've got the opposite of sleeves. What's that? Torso tattoo. All covered. Just repping 661 Bakersfield. You feel me? 
I've got my name and number, jersey number from football in high school on, the, on my back. No, I don't. What if I did? That'd be crazy. No. But I've got tattoos on my body, and there's nothing in Scripture that prevents that from taking place. Why was it wrong back then? Because the nations around them tatted themselves in order to worship foreign deities, and God said, you as my people are going to be set apart, right? So um, to demonstrate that set-apartness, there were actually laws that today would make no sense and God would have no beef over, but he said, I don't want you to make a cloth that has two different types of yarn in it. Why? Because I want you to recognize how desperately I want you to be set apart. Don't worship the foreign idols of the gods around you. Don't do it. You're going to find death there. You're gonna, it's going to feel good to worship in the temple of foreign gods to, to sleep with their prostitutes. But don't intermingle with them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Do not go there. It will, it will cause me anger and it will lead to your death. Because I want you to be set apart. To be different then. To be cut off. To be separate. And so the covenant of circumcision God makes with a man named Abraham and he says, in the same way that you must recognize that being one of my people is going to mean you're, you're going to need to be separate and holy and cut off, I want you to take every male on the eighth day of their life and I want you to take their member and take the foreskin and then you cut off the end of it. Okay, so... I've gotten to do this with all three of my boys, not me, <laughs> in the backyard. Hello, guys. Uh, I'm your father. This is going to be weird. Um, but actually, for our second two boys, um, we, they were circumcised by a Jewish rabbi. Okay? He was a doctor, so he's, he's got, he knows what he's doing. But he's also a Jewish rabbi. So he like put on this music, and he was like chanting Old Testament verses in Hebrew while he was— because it was a very meaningful experience for them. Because in Jewish culture, leading to today, in, in Jewish culture, there's still, it's still a mark of the promise. Now, we as Christians no longer have this as a mandated mark of the promise. Why? Because Jesus was cut off for us. Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament circumcision when he was, just like that process of circumcision, he was hurt, he was cut off, and it was th he was thrown away just like the dead foreskin would be. He became the circumcision for us. He was what was cut off in order to make us holy. So we are no longer mandated in that. And so now if you're a modern day Jew and you tell people that people have to get circumcised, like uh, Peter does in the book of Galatians or, or the, the Gnostics are teaching or the Judaizers are doing, like we find in this text, Paul pushes back against that and says, don't you realize what circumcision was? That wasn't what made you holy. That was a demonstration of something that was happening internally. That's why Jeremiah in the Old Testament Chapter 4, he says, look forward to a day where not, your flesh won't be circumcised, but your heart will be circumcised. Well, you'll have to cut the old dead things out of your heart in order to be set apart and holy. Here's what Paul's going to talk about here in Romans chapter 2. Now that everyone's a little bit grossed out by what we just talked about, okay? That process, again, takes place on the eighth day after the child is born, um, not, we don't actually get the reason why this takes place in the Old Testament, except for modern medical uh, um, advice would give you, if you ever wanted to circumcise your kid, you should do it on what day? You can get, well, if God told us to do it on the eighth day, what day do you think medical advancements are telling us when to do it? The eighth day. Okay, God invented the human structure. And on the eighth day, there's actually an incredible 110% boost in prothrombin and vitamin K, which is the coagulating and the, the clotting aspect of your blood, is at the highest peak in your whole life on the eighth day after you're born. So it made, even though it's a, it, it is not cute, okay, it doesn't feel good. I was, not, I, I don't remember, but I was there for my kids and they weren't like, what was that? There's a, it hurts. It's painful, okay? And even though he was chanting Jewish things 
while like, in the Hebrew, I could hear them screaming. It was not good, right? And so over the centuries, there's been this like back and forth of like, is it actually um, healthier for men? Is it whatever? But that's not the main point of any of it. The main point of any of, of those things for the Jewish people was it was a demonstration that if I'm going to follow Yahweh, things are going to have to be cut off and I'm going to be part of this. So even if you were an adult and you came into ethnic Israel and you wanted to worship Yahweh, guess what? You had to be circumcised. That's no fun, right? It's no fun when you're eight days old. It's super different than when you're 18 years old. That's a different process. But this is what Paul is talking about here. Romans chapter 2, and we are going to begin at verse 17. We'll go through the end of the chapter. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God. Okay, so remember the background to this. The Jews have come back potentially to Rome and the, uh, back to Rome. And the Jews that are there come and meet with the Gentiles who have taken over the church. And the Gentiles start going, we don't need to circumcise people. Paul tells us we don't have to. Peter said we don't have to. So he start, they start going, we're going to stop doing these things. And the Jews are like, yeah, but it's tradition. It's religious adherence. We should keep doing these things. And Paul goes, if you want to, great. If you start telling people they must or they're going to be condemned, you're wrong. So he says, now look, listen, if you call yourself a Jew, you rely on the law, you boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law. So if you know the Torah, if you know the scriptures, you become convinced that you're a guide for the blind. You're a light for those in darkness, an instructor for the foolish, a teacher of little children because you have the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, why don't you take some time to teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, why do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, why do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? So he's using this argument. It's used again and again in the scriptures. God is pushing back and kicking against the idea that his laws and statutes are meant for some sort of strict religious obedience for its own sake. When, when Jesus is walking our dirt and toiling over our sod, and he's looking at the way that human beings have begun to practice things meant for our joy and our comfort and our pleasure, he looks at him and goes, didn't I tell you as God rested on the seventh day, so I want you, my people, to rest and observe the providence of God. I don't want you working. On that day, I want you to be blessed. I, I don't want you out in the fields toiling all day thinking that if you don't work, God's not going to provide. So rest. Sabaoth. That means to rest, have Shabbat, eat a meal, enjoy your family, because you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be 72 on death's doorstep. Not that all 72 years on death's doorstep, but right, like you're going to face a, a future, slow down. And so the religious leaders went, slow down, good, okay, we will. Let's have a meeting and a council to figure out what slowing down means. All right, you, Shmuel, what do you think it means? Well, I feel like 36 steps, in my opinion, would be not slowing down. So anything short of 35 is resting. Good, Shmuel, write it down. 35 steps on Sabbath. What about you? Well, I would think that lifting anything or pushing anything or pulling anything is also work. So no pushing, pulling, or anything on the Sabbath. Good, this is really good. This, is, this must be what God must have meant when he said, I want you to rest, right? And so people are like, yay, time for Sabbath. And the religious leaders are like, ah, 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 ah. Here's what resting looks like. Don't take this many steps. Don't eat this. Don't go there. Don't push this. Don't pull that. And God's up there going, you, what? Y'all thought I, I said rest, and now you've made rules on what rest looks like? You think that was, <laughs> what does Jesus say? I don't understand. Is the stomach made to ingest food, or is food made to go into the stomach? You guys, have, the, the tail's wagging the dog here. I've given you the Sabbath for rest. I didn't give you rest so you could create the Sabbath. You're missing the, the point of this whole thing. 
And so it has been with almost every religious thing that we've been giving. We, we create rules and boundaries around it. And then we go, all right, this must have been what God had in mind. And we've missed the point completely. So this is what he's criticizing them for. If you, verse 25, circumcision has value if you know why it's there. But if you break it, okay, what's its value? The value is you've been cut off. You've been separated, okay? You're different and you're holy. If you recognize that, sure, circumcision can have value. But if you break the law and go, it's okay because I've been, I'm not going to point down. It's okay because I've been circumcised. I can do whatever I want to do because I've been circumcised. I don't do what God wants me to do. I don't love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I've been circumcised, so who cares? God's going, that, that you've, you've really missed the boat on this one. Right? If, if you leaning into the truth of God's love for you choose to get circumcised, as a, great. But circumcision covering a multitude of sins is foolishness. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? Okay, so now he says, now imagine a Gentile who doesn't have their foreskin cut off, but actually adheres to the rules of God and delights in their pleasure. It's like they've been circumcised. They're like, no, but they haven't. Yeah, but they have. Because the point of circumcision was not just the, the taking off of foreskin, it was the leaning into the covenant of God. So if you lean into the covenant of God and yet you haven't been circumcised, guess what? Yes, you have. Because the whole point of it was I recognize what the law requires of me. I know that I'm insufficient. I know that I need a circumcision not done by human hands but done by the king of the universe like Colossians talks about. I need help. And if your heart is leaning into that, why would a physical, it, it would be like this. It'd be like, what's more important? if you commit to someone in marriage, that you have a ceremony where you pronounce your vows and make your promises and live in a home and take care of one another, or a ring? This should be an easy answer for you. This is, which one's more important? The first or the second? The first, right? Any fool can pick up a ring. Mine's made of silicone, okay? So if you took my ring and you went like Lord of the Rings, you're like, mmm, Schmeagol, whatever, Okay? Some nerd in here is like, it's, not, it's technically Gollum. Okay, uh, right? If you grab my ring and you go, got it. Yeah, now who's married to Carolyn? <laughs> Everyone disappears. Okay. You look crazy, right? Everyone be like, yeah, that doesn't make you married. Yeah, but I've got the ring, right? <laughs> in a very similar fashion, going, look, I've been certain, don't look. Look, I've been circumcised. As a, this is, it's admittedly a weird conversation. This is why you exposit the text. You've got to run into these awkward passages. I would have just skipped and gone on to chapter 3. I have to. Okay, I've got to deal with this. You wouldn't go, yeah, I, I, I don't do any of the precepts of leaning into the covenant. I don't do the things of God. I don't worship God. I don't love God. I don't trust in God. I don't do any of those things. But look, the ring, right? Like, that's kind of a weird visual. But the, the ring would still be there, right? Look, look it, just the ring is all that matters, the ring matters if it's representative of a covenant of marriage, but if it's not representative of that, any of you could take this ring and consider yourself married, but you'd look goofy, right? It wouldn't make any sense. If you put cheese on your head and you're like, look, I'm a burger, we'd all be like, you're weird, you know? Like, <laughs> it's all that, what makes a burger burger is cheese on the head. That's all it is. There's a lot more to, okay, well, every analogy falls apart. Some at the beginning. Okay, here we go. Verse 27, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. So I, if I could have the choice between you living as if you were married in the covenant and loving her and taking care of her and providing for her or wearing a ring, I gotta be honest with you. I'd rather you do these things and not have a ring than have a ring and not doing these things. I'd rather you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength than you having a circumcised member. Honestly, if I could have a choice between the two, I don't really care about the latter. I care about the former. And sometimes the danger is you have the latter without the former and you still think you're doing okay. Sometimes all you have is religious observance and you have no heart. This is what, this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees. You guys tithe. That's good. You should. But you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law. You should tithe for sure. 
But where's justice in your life? Where is truth in your life? Where is love in your life? Where is you taking care of the outcast? What is true religion that Paul talks about? To lo- or James talks about to love the widow and the orphan. Where is that in your life? Once you have that and you tithe, it'll be an acceptable sacrifice to God. But if all you have is that, this is not an acceptable sacrifice. Because though your money is near to me, your hearts are far from me. As it is with everything else. This is why for all of us here who are, we're so engrossed in Christianese and the church and religious observance, we can find ourselves practicing the things of God while being desperately far away from the heart of God. Because church is a safe place to hide from Jesus. If you haven't noticed that yet. If you're walking down San Diego State's campus in wearing next to nothing on a Thursday night and a Christian missionary walks up, they're gonna go, you need Jesus. Well, you need Jesus. You, need, you walk in these doors and no one's gonna ask you if you need Jesus. They assume you have him. And so it's a safe place to hide, right? And the more I wear the Christian outfits and I sing the Christian songs and I raise my Christian hands and I fly my Christian banner, the more that God is permeating all of our hearts and looking past through what man looks at and into the heart and going, yes, but am I in there? But do I have relationship with you? That's why it says many on the last day will knock on the door and say, Lord, Lord, let me in. And I will say, I don't know who you are or where you've come from. (laughs) When did you get here? I've been here the whole time. Yeah, you've physically been here, but your heart is far from me. I've never known you. I don't know where you've come from. You just showed up in the last minute and called me Lord, Lord. You spent 60 years calling yourself Lord, Lord. And then as soon as you die, you're going to call me Lord, Lord? Away from me. I don't know who you are. A person is not a Jew. That's not the end of the sentence. I just forgot where it was. (laughs) A person is not a Jew. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No. A person is a Jew, part of God's covenant Israel, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people but from God. Here's the three things I want us to to take away kind of in this conversation. I I recognize it's, it it makes you blush a little bit, but also remember how deeply ingrained the idea of circumcision was to the Jewish community. This is a very sacred thing. It still is. Because they've missed the Messiah, Jesus Christ, this is still a sacred thing. Because the circumcision of the cross that takes away the sin and takes on the bloody, grotesque nature of the cutting off displayed on Jesus still remains on the people Israel to fulfill. That's why it was so important for that rabbi doctor to do what he did to my son, knowing that I was a messianic man. I believe in Jesus as the Messiah. It was still a a powerful moment that my recognition, and and this is a very deep one, I think, to have, especially here in San Diego, where we have a very profound and dedicated Jewish community all around us. I remember the last time that I went to Israel, I was walking in the the underground tunnels. So um, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and then the conquest of the Muslims, they came in and took over the most sacred holy sites and then built Dome of the Rock on top of the temple. So the temple is like way underground. I don't know if you guys um, have studied this at all, but that's how you kind of did everything in the ancient Near East. You would take someone's land or, or temple down or whatever it is, and you'd build on top of it for a number of reasons. One, it was to, um, in some cases, demonstrate sovereignty over that, right? Look what we have done. And then secondly, it uh, also, you be, create what's called a tell. So you want to be higher up so you can see the surrounding people coming. So the higher you are up on a hill, the more you can see your enemies approaching. So when they take down the temple, which is on top of Mount, uh, the mountain of Jerusalem, they build their most holy sites on there. So you now, if you are a Christian or Jew, anything, anyone but a Muslim, the closest you can get to the original temple, which has now been ransacked and is buried in dozens of feet under the ground, is you have to go underground, and there's these massive Herodian stones. And when I say Herod, they're from the time of Herod, Okay, so 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, they have these stones underground that are like 30 feet long and like 10 feet high and like 15 feet deep. I can't even begin to explain to you how big these stones are. Just you, you could, with modern equipment, you couldn't move these things. So it's one of the, these miracles that you're like, how in the world did they do this? But you're standing there, and then under, you go through these passageways, and then all of a sudden you come across a whole bunch of Jews standing in a row. 
And these Jews standing in a row are doing their daily prayers and they're moving back and forth. They're keeping rhythm and they're keeping time and they're keeping themselves focused by moving their body. And you're walking behind them and they are as close as you can get to the original Holy of Holies underground near this, knowing that there's about 30 feet of debris between them and the Holy of Holies in here that has now been ransacked. They want to worship as close to the presence of God as they can possibly get. As close to the Spirit of God that's inside the Holy of Holies as they can get. And the irony of ironies is the closest they've ever been to the Spirit of God is when I walked by them. Because I have now become the temple. And in Christ, where the temple veil was torn, God now makes his residence in us through the Holy Spirit. And so as close as they want to get to the presence of God, they've never been closer than when I, filled with the Holy Spirit, walked next to them. This is the promise of all of those who are in Christ that now have has usurped the old idea of the Jewish way of things. And that's why we plead for our Jewish friends to recognize that Messiah has come. The one who has made a way has come. The temple is destroyed for a very specific reason. Jesus prophesied that it would be destroyed and then it is destroyed. Why? Because that's the passing away of old things. That was just a placeholder for the better temple, which is the self, cleansed out by God, circumcision of the heart where the spirit can now reside, cutting off old things. So the three things I want us to recognize when it comes to circumcision and then one thing in how we understand whether or not our hearts have been circumcised is this. Let's start with point number one. When it comes to circumcision, your set-apartness in your life, just like circumcision, entering into covenant with the God of the universe must be calculated. Right? If you're a 22-year-old and you get taken over by a Jewish nation in the Old Testament and they say, here's what it means to follow Yahweh. And you're like, okay, cool. What do I have to do? Like, eat something weird or like, I have to like climb a mountain or something. They're like, you need to cut off the foreskin of your penis. What? Yeah. Why? What do you mean why? God said so. Oh. Yeah, I don't think I want that, right? It, but it's God from day one going, yeah, um, might as well get to it. This is going to cost you everything. What do you think? Nah. <laughs> That's a lot. No, thank you. Following the God of the universe must be calculated. This is why I think sometimes when you start to teach the Bible, you can have people who've grown up in the church but have always been taught like topical easy beliefism, which is that we're all in because God is a God of love and that's all he requires is that everyone just goes, I love God, you love God, we love God, everyone loves God. But then, listen to this. If you were to, if, if the Bible were chat GPT or Google, and you said, following God is free, it's easy, it's simple. All I have to do is say I love God and that's the end of the story, right? It's going to be easy. If you ask the Bible, hey, Bible, chat GPT, what does it take for me to follow God? Listen, he's going to say, you're a good person, everything's going to go great, it's going to be really easy, it's going to be simple. Here's what it would come back in Jesus' says chat GPT. I don't know what that would be called. But Matthew 10, 38. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. John 15, 18. The world's going to hate you because it hated me first. Because if you belong to the world, it would love you. But you do not belong to the world. You belong to me. That's why the world's going to hate you. 1 Timothy 3, 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Luke 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves of all of their daily pleasures. Whoever wants to save their life is going to have to lose it. And if you want to lose your life for me, you're going to save it. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those... Blessed are those who are insulted by people, persecuted by people, and who have been given false accusations against all kind of evil because of me. First Peter 4.12, do not be surprised at the fiery or ordeal that has come on to you for the sake of suffering in Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Mark 13.13, 13, everyone will hate you because of me. Romans 8.17, 8, we share in his sufferings in order that we also might share in his glory. 1 Peter 2.21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps and his suffering. Acts 14.22, you must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. 
So this idea, I think what we come across oftentimes is we enter into a setting where we open up the scripture and we simply go, God, I'm ready to read what I want out of this. I'm ready to give you in so much as I feel like giving you as long as it doesn't hurt. You can have my life and then as God approaches us and he says, are you ready to give me everything? Like here's a, let me give an example. Luke, can you, can you come up here with me? I know I didn't ask you. I know you don't want to, but I appreciate that this is, this is a willing sacrifice, okay? I'm not gonna hurt you. Okay, Luke. Luke, okay? Good looking guy, right? Uh, now, let's say that I were to say, can I have your jacket? Would you give me your jacket? Like, I could have your jacket. Would you be okay with me having your jacket? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, that's fair. After all I've done for you, that's, that's fine. That makes sense. Okay, just kidding. But now, if I said, I've got a trillion dollars, but as soon as I ask for something, you've got to give it to me. Left shoe. How quickly would you get that shoe off? You don't need to do it. How quickly would you get that shoe off? Very. Right. You might actually just go, is there going to be an article of clothing? And I said, like, yeah, but you need to give it to me completely and quickly. You might, in a sense of self-preservation and foresight, do what? Take it all off and just set it before me and go, yeah, whatever you want, okay? <laughs> We've talked a lot about nakedness today. You can go have a seat. Thank you. Okay, so the idea behind this is simple. This is what God is saying. I have created and reformed the universe as a place for your ultimate understanding of me to be in relationship with me forever, that you might know truth and love completely and we will be in perfect unity in a restored earth with no pain and no suffering and no tears and no brokenness. I have shed the blood of my son on a cross for you. Do you want that in your life? If you find that as beautiful as a trillion dollars and God says, but I'm going to come by your house first and I'm going to ask you for some things. And you're able to actually tangibilize the things of your heart. Okay? So all of your money is then wrapped up in one little uh, box and it's labeled money. It's all you've got. And it's right there. And then it's all of your future in a box. Future right there. And these are the lusts of your flesh, the things that you desire. These are your wants. These are your pleasures. It's right here. And in here are all of your aspirations, your white picket fence American dream. And that's right here. And God says, for a trillion dollars, push that box towards me. Here you go. Here you go. Um, Four boxes. Three's pretty good. Three's pretty solid. Okay? So the, the, we got my, my white picket fence you can have. And then over here, we, we, we talked about all my money. <laughs> Let's be honest. There's not a ton of that. So for sure. And these are the, and, but this one, right? And we've all got a this one. This one is going to stay with me. And some of you are this one are relationships. And some of your this one is success. And some of your this one is your absolute insecurity to ever look like anything other than someone who has it all together. So you can't even fall apart in front of the king. So there's all this dignity in this one box. And yet all of who we are is broken up, compartmentalized, boxed, and then set there. And what God is saying is, I don't think you understand my beauty if you're withholding any of those boxes. In the same way, if a trillion dollars was in front of you and it took you taking everything off, you would go, absolutely how fast do you want it in fact you know what you want one shoe take the other shoe while you're at it if this is all you're going to ask for me be, why because shoes are so invaluable or or so uh insignificant compared to a trillion dollars so we simply go a shoe for a trillion dollars <laughs> this is the goofiness of considering your time here on earth worth anything in comparison to your eternity it's the same math that we don't know how to do like this you want 70 years for 100 billion trillion years? <laughs> I'm not going to take my clothes off. But, right, it's like the, this is the idea. That every box that we have, we're like, you just want, 
you want my life here? <laughs> you, for an eternity of years? Hold on. That, would be, that, would, that, that, that is relatively as goofy as if you walked up on stage and I had a trunk of a trillion dollars and I said, give me your shoe. And you went, this shoe. Oh. No. I, 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 this shoe's been some places, man. Uh, I was wearing this shoe the first time that I ever wore this shoe. You don't understand, man. This is like a, this is like vans, right? I made it on preachers with sneakers one time with this. 1999 at Ross. Eat your heart out, Stephen Furtick. Okay. <laughs> what would you be screaming at someone standing up here, going, "Give me something that costs 20 bucks for a trillion dollars"? You would all be screaming the same thing. Take it. Give him your dang shoe. It's a freaking shoe. This is all the saints and all the angels of heaven right now looking at your life while you hold on to your 50, 60, 70, every part of your 60, 70, 80 years. Because they've been sitting for uh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years going, trust me, friend, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's the Tim Keller quote from a few weeks ago. What are you going to say when you first see the kingdom of God? And he says, oh, no one on that day who has given up everything is going to feel anything more than regret that they didn't give it up sooner. The only sense I get in the kingdom that we will ever have any semblance of regret is the first moment we see it and we wish that we had given more up for it. And maybe talk to more people about the majesty of what you're seeing. And maybe to lay down your concern of your awkwardness so that the person that you've been praying for but never had the nerve to actually talk to could maybe see what you're seeing right now. Oh, I get it. The problem is as finite beings, everything that we see and everything that we have, it feels so magnanimous to let go. But can you just imagine seeing the God of the universe face to face and facing judgment and finally recognizing what it means to be a soul that never dies, living for an infinite number of years, and then looking back on your life and having forfeited eternity with God because you clung to worldly pleasures and you in that moment recognize the real value of your life and your soul and you see the throne room of God and you just go, how in the world did I let this happen? That's the most terrifying thing I could imagine for myself and anyone that I love, and that includes you, is that you would stand face to face with the king and would, have, would not have recognized what he's asking for from you. Everything. And he's not asking for everything because he thinks it's a, it's a big deal. He's asking everything from you because in a heavenly perspective, it's nothing. It's just everything to you. It's everything to me. And in, in, <laughs> in our, I think it's 100 and, 102, 156, somebody did the math one time. In a, our 100, and, or 56, 56.25 billion years in heaven will make our whole life here on earth proportionate to one second of your life here on this, on this planet. So in other words, if I asked you to give up a second of your life, one second of your life, for God's kingdom and his riches forever, everyone would go, of course. But one day your entire life here on earth, 70 years, whatever it might be of life, will be proportionally one second to the amount of time you've lived in eternity. You will literally look back on your life as one second in comparison. G Jim Elliott, who was killed at the spear of a tribe he was trying to evangelize in Ecuador, he writes this phrase, he is no fool who gives up what he can't hold on to to attain that which he refuses to let go of. You are not a fool 
if you let go of something temporary to cling to something eternal. You are wise. You get it then. So the first thing about understanding the circumcision of the heart, entering into the covenant must be calculated. But do not buy into modern evangelical easy beliefism. No one told you this is going to be easy. At least the Bible didn't. If your pastor did, he's not telling you the truth. All of those things, what's it going to take? Death, hatred, pain, brokenness, betrayal. This is going to be your life. Number two, the implications of the circumcision of the heart. This change is going to be both obvious and hidden. Okay? Circumcision is an obvious change to those who know where to look, but it's also hidden from the generalized world. Okay? When the Lord examines your heart, he will know whether or not your heart has been circumcised But there is a way of outwardly demonstrating, look how good I am as a person, but inside nothing has changed. But when the Lord looks at us, it says he doesn't look at what mankind looks at. He doesn't take into consideration their height and their beauty in these things. He looks through what is obvious and into the heart of people. So you must recognize that following Jesus means that there will be things on the outside that change because you're now walking with the king, but it's going to be as a result of something inward that no one can see which is a change of the heart. Circumcision is an outward sign to anyone who knows, but to most of the world it's going to be hidden. You following Christ is not something you sit up and boast and go, look at how good of a person I am. It should be when the Lord looks through what man looks at and sees your heart, it should be changed from the inside out. And if you're relying on religious braggadocia to prove to people that you're a follower of God, that's not going to do it. That's what the Pharisees did. And Jesus called them whitewashed sarcophaguses. Whitewashed, bedazzled coffins is what he calls them. You're like someone who's invested a whole bunch of money in the thing that they get buried in. Your skin is nothing but a coffin. And it looks great on the outside, but inside it's dead. Your circumcision will have an external change. But you really want that when the Lord examines your heart to find true internal change. Lastly, number three. Just kidding, that's our symbol. I probably forgot to put that one up there. Uh, Number three, so you can just write this down. Oh, there it is. It's going to hurt. Okay? Circumcision of the heart is going to hurt. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus and nothing in your life has been circumcised or cut off or taken away, then I just have to challenge you. When you read the text and what it means to follow Jesus, you don't find anyone that goes, I was who I was, then I found Jesus. And I'm still who I was. The book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about it like this. If anyone is in Christ, he's become a new creation. The old is dead, the new is here. That's circumcision language. The old me has been cut off. The old me is like the foreskin. It's gone. It's dying. It's decaying. And the Lord has brought this to new life. I am a new creation in Christ. It's going to hurt. Crucifixion of the flesh that Colossians talk about is not just a metaphor for death, but of the gore and the blood and the trauma. Now, it, it, you're, right, when you think about circumcision, we might think of like some process that kids go through. But I can tell you what, when you're a 25-year-old and you get circumcised like they did in the Old Covenant, it was not pretty, right? For some of us, it's going to mean saying no to other things in our life that it's going to cost us a lot. It's going to be messed up. It's going to be gross. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Why? Because the world latches onto us like a parasite, right? If you've ever had a tick on you and you pull it off, it starts to bleed. Why? Because it's been making its home in you. It's it's not going to be without its effects on you. This process is going to hurt. I'm having a conversation later tonight with my goddaughter who thinks that she should be dating a non-believer. And my conversation is going to be really short. What does the Bible say? Okay. What is more important to you? To be marketed by man or to be marked by God? What's more important to you? Be obedient to him or to be accepted in your friends group? I'm not saying her answer is going to be to be obedient to God. I just need to hear it because if she really doesn't know and she really hasn't heard it, it's an easy concept. This is not a difficult conversation. It's a simple one. When something is simple, like do not be unequally yoked to a non-believer, for what, right, for what 
uh, distinction is there between, or, or for what communion does righteousness have with unrighteousness or light with darkness? This is what the scripture says clearly about dating someone who isn't following Jesus. But simple things are different than easy things. No one in here doesn't know what the Bible means when it tells us the Ten Commandments. No one's here like, what does lying actually mean? And yet we gossip. Why? Because not using our words to harm people is simple, but it's also difficult. Don't confuse those things. Following God is simple. It'll cost you everything. Simple is very different than easy. I'm going to finish with this. Because at the other end of the circumcision of the heart is, for so many of us, we just feel like we're walking around in it. And we're struggling through these different implications. There's a man named John Newton. You may have heard of him before. He was a a slave ship captain, born in 1725 in London, England. He became an orphan at the age of six. His father was a sea captain. He was forced into the British Navy as an orphan. Then afterwards, he ended up working on a slave ship in the transatlantic slave ship. So he would go over to Africa and he would pick up um, black slaves and bring them back over to America. He captained many voyages where thousands of African men, women, and children were captured and sold into slavery. In 1748, he was caught in a violent storm at sea. He had a near-death encounter, began to question his life choices, and he turned to God for salvation. The experience marked the beginning of a spiritual transformation that John Newton had. But he didn't immediately stop working for the slave trade. Until in 1954, he left the slave trade and began to study theology. He was ordained as a minister in 1764 and became a pastor at a little church in Olney, England. Newton was known for his pastoral care and his ability to preach and write moving sermons and hymns. In his later years, Newton, recognizing the folly of his transatlantic slave captaining, began his life as an abolitionist, deeply regretting his involvement in the slave trade. In 1788, he published a powerful pamphlet pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, where he is uniquely credited alongside of William Wilberforce, one of the leading figures in the British abolition movement to campaign for the end of slavery, often being contributed, contributed as being one of those who stopped it worldwide. Newton's work and influence helped to turn public opinion against slavery in Britain and beyond. This powerful testimony of slave trader to advocate for abolition was a powerful testament to the possibility of transformation through grace. He continued preaching until his death in 1807, which is the same year that the abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed in Britain. He had given his whole life and had finally been successful that slaves would know freedom in Christ. And it began the abolition movement that reached all the way over to America. In 1772, He wrote a series of hymns, you might know one, called Amazing Grace. In one of his other hymns, he writes this phrase that I want to end with tonight. What does it mean for us to have a fully circumcised heart? What's the goal? What's the end result? How do you know you've made it? That you have a fully circumcised heart? Here's what you can understand. The mark of a fully circumcised heart is this. When my oughts, when obedience, when what God calls me to do, when his word, when the scriptures, when the holy texts of God and what he asks for from my life and my pleasure become the same thing. Friend, I don't know how freaking far I am away from this, but I'm frustrated at myself. I have recognized in my life from being a young man to who I am today, through the death of my wife, through the everything else that I've gone through in my life, there feels like a slow circumcision of the heart that's leading to a place where the more that I lean into what God has for my life, the more pleasure that I find. The more that I stop leaning into the sloth of who I am and the, the, the acedia of my soul and the inertia of my laziness, and the more that I pick my butt up and I do the things that God has called me to do, I have begun to find, to find pleasure in those things. But I'm just not there yet. I still seek pleasure outside of God as if it's ever been there. I don't, even have, I don't even have examples in my life of when I did things my own way and they ended in greater pleasure. I know what temporary fleeting pleasure feels like outside of God's 
of God's work and God's kingdom, but it always leads to destruction, which hurts a lot more than the pleasure of obedience would ever would have. And so the circumcision of the heart that we have to be yearning for as men is that one day the refinement of the circumcision of our heart would take place so unequivocally and so totally and so completely that as I walk my life, I'm living in God's word and I'm living in his will and it's actually the very root of all of my pleasure instead of something different than it. I feel like so often when I look at what God has called me to do, I see pleasure on one side and then God's word on the other side and I have to pick a fork in the road. I can't wait till they're the same thing. I'm just not there yet. And so the Holy Spirit continues to circumcise my heart and continues to cut away old dead things. And I have to learn from experience. Some of you are like me. You've got to pay your own dumb tax and you've got to make these failures in everything. But we want to every day as Christians go closer and closer. Why? Because in the seat of God himself is pleasures forevermore. This is what C.S. Lewis tells us. This is what the New Testament tells us. In Revelation, he's making all things new. He's prepared a place for us of, of infinite pleasure. But it can start today because following his command is the same thing as the ultimate pleasure of what we're going to experience. And so John Newton says it much more eloquently than I do, but I'm going to end with this line. In the same batch of hymns that we hear, isn't this a, a powerful thing now? Imagine a former slave trader writing this. Amazing grace. How sweet that sound that saved a wretch like me. Isn't it funny that it's not talking about some esoteric person out there who wrote that? Now you know what he did. Because of the, the culture he lived in and the bigotry of his own heart, he was trading humans for money because their, their, the, the amount of melanin in their skin was greater than his own. Do you want to know what he calls himself? A wretch. A wicked man. How great must grace be that someone like me might be found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Here's what he writes to conclude our time together. Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined apart no more. Our pleasure and our duty were once opposites. But when you recognize how deeply Jesus loves you, you'll see them as the same thing. I think about my kids, and when I give them prohibitions, and I give them admonitions, and I give them commands, it is for nothing else than their pleasure. I was at my son's baseball game today. Some of the interns were there. They can attest to this. My daughter was climbing the outsides of the fences and everything and falling and cutting herself and hurting herself. So I'm disciplining the folly out of her and it's not because I really like disciplining my kids or I don't want my kids to experience any joy. I don't want them to get tetanus and I don't think that makes me a bad dad. And what I have in store for them is so much better, but in their futile, tiny little minds, they see my commands as some sort of limitation. And one day, if my daughter Finley will just lean into the truth that at my joy and in my pleasure, that my commands are there to bolster it, not to take it away. But she will grow up, and she will reject this. And one day, instead of rejecting me, she'll reject Jesus' understanding of this. And she will be on the same path that her father is on, of walking around going, if only I trusted that you actually loved me more than I could ever understand. What if I just trusted that your command wasn't to separate me from my pleasure, but at the other side of obedience is pleasures forevermore. Our pleasure and our duty, what we want and what we enjoy and what we lust after and our greatest, deepest passions used to be separate from the, ob the, the ob obligations of duty. Here's what I have to do. Here's the 10 commandments over here. Here's all the, the, the things that God calls us to. They used to be opposite. But when we finally recognize the beauty and the majesty and the love of God, would those become the same thing? That's the fully circumcised heart. There is no longer distinction between what I want and my pleasures and what God has called me to do because in him are pleasures greater than we could ever know and ever understand. He is holy, he is set apart. May we be a people of circumcised hearts. But let me... Bear it to you really simply. It's gonna hurt.
But if you've been pitched a version of Christianity, a painless Christianity, a sacrificeless Christianity, a submissionless Christianity, you have never heard the gospel before. It is in there. It is true as everything that we can possibly read. Would we be a culture that leans into that in our church? Our pleasure and our duty, though opposites before, in the presence of your beauty, are, are set apart no more. They're joined apart no more. They are one and the same. Would you pray with me? Lord, would, would you, um, I, don't, I don't need you to do a work any further than myself. This is not really a sermon that I just need everyone here to understand. I, this is one that I, just, I need you to do a work within me. I, I love how the father in Jewish culture oftentimes was the one who circumcised the son. And God, though in here, the New Testament makes it very clear that this is no longer strictly a male thing that would seal the family, but instead it's available to all people. The circumcision of the heart is not exclusive to any particular gender or any particular sex. It's, it's available to all people because you yourself were cut apart and separated from the Father in order to demonstrate that you have become the circumcision that we only symbolized in the Old Covenant. And that symbol was just a mark of saying, following me, I want to, I wanna, it's, it's just, it's such an honest and lovingly honest thing to tell us right up front, this is going to cost you everything. But the reward on the other side is like taking off a shoe and trading it for a trillion dollars. So Lord, as we enter into this second half of worship and we sing songs like, I'm never going back to my old. The cross before me and your treasure is before me. When your cross is before me, when your heaven is before me, when your future is before me, everything else in your sight is gonna go vaguely dim. Everything else is worthy to be put on the altar. It's pennies, it's pitiless, it's a second in comparison. It's nothing, it's compartmentalized junk, it's rubbish. And God, it's really easy for me to say that and really hard for me to live that out. Would you show me the sufficiency of Christ and the insufficiency of this world? Would I see it with your eyes tonight for the first time? Thank you for your love for me and your forgiveness for me because I screw this up every stinking day. I just, I'm, I need you to do a work in my heart. We pray all these things in your name, amen.